Hey folks, your OS Reviews, you're watching our video review of the HomeTop S9 Plus. This is a unlocked 4G smartphone that retails for $200, but sometimes can be found as low as $160. I'll leave some links down below. At this price, you're getting a device with incredible value. Compared to other low-cost unlocked uh, phones from companies that are competitors, like for instance Bluebo, such as the... Uh, you know, S1 over here, I actually find that the S9 to be a bit more sleek in terms of its design. In addition, it performs slightly faster in regular day-to-day -day use. So overall, I would say that this is the slightly better pick. Um, for now, we're going to discuss just this device and we'll come out with a more complete comparison soon, so be sure to stay tuned for that. All right, so starting with the design as well as the hardware, what's also interesting about the S9 Plus is it features a 18 by 9 aspect ratio, which follows in the footsteps of the LG G6. As a result, it's a great display for interacting with media and watching movies, but more importantly, if you're holding this phone using one hand, it's a lot more feasible than devices that have a, uh, let's say, 16x9 or 4x3 aspect ratio. So as a result, uh, you can hold the device without feeling like it's significantly larger than a typical 5-inch, you know, 5.5-inch device. What's also interesting about the S9 is, of course, it uh, employs one of these uh, fairly recent, quote, bezel-less designs uh, in the same fashion of as the LG, as the Xiaomi Mi Mix. It's not truly bezel-less. You can see there's a rather large chin at the bottom, but everything else from the sides, including the top, has been minimized to a large extent. And as a ho whole, it feels like you're holding onto content rather than, than a device when you're watching movies and using the camera app. And again, it's a pretty beautiful screen to look at. Furthermore, you also have some pretty surprisingly good specifications underneath the hood, and that includes four gigs of built-in RAM, 64 gigs of built-in storage, expandable via a micro SD card, and an octa-core 1.5 gigahertz processor by MediaTek. Surprisingly, this particular chipset, in my day-to-day -day use at least, seems a little bit smoother and more responsive than the Helio P25 that was found on the Bluebo S1. Despite the Helio P25 having a clock speed of 2.5 gigahertz, which seems significantly faster, this one actually has a slight edge, in my opinion, when I was doing some web browsing earlier, and again, it just seems very stable in terms of performance. Otherwise, the phone also feels quite substantial in the hand, and that's because of the construction quality. Not only is it employing 2.5 5D curved glass on the top, so it makes swiping very easy. There's also glass used on the back, which is very shiny. Unfortunately, it's a huge fingerprint and smudge magnet, just like on the S1. But uh, it's a downside, but at the same time, it's a beautiful surface that makes the phone, again, seem much more premium. There's also a very interesting pattern if you reflect it underneath the light that makes it glimmer and shine, kind of like the uh, current Samsung Galaxy S8. So very interesting from the design perspective. Another reason why the phone feels quite hefty is because the entire frame is made out of a machine aluminum so it has a very thick durable feel um, and you can see some antenna bends which are made out of plastic so that you can have better reception for 4G LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS on here. Taking a quick look at some of the hardware elements, the bottom features a micro USB port for charging. Yes, it's not USB Type-C, but one of the benefits is because you're using micro USB, they've actually still retained the traditional 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. This is a feature that you won't find on many computer, competing models like the Bluebo S1, and so if you enjoy listening to music a lot, this phone will really please you. Furthermore, the micro USB supports OTG. So what that means is you can easily plug in accessories, thumb drives, keyboard, and mouse by using an adapter, which they actually provide one in the box, which is pretty nice. So for instance, I can simply pl uh, plug this adapter in, and I'm connected right now to a nano receiver, which is for a wireless mouse. And uh, over here, you can see that as I'm moving, a cursor has appeared on screen. So it basically transforms the phone into a mini computer, which is incredibly cool. Um, it's not going to be you know, for every situation, but I can wirelessly uh, mirror the phone's display onto a television or onto a desktop uh, screen, and all of a sudden I can do some pretty good productivity and work from uh, you know looking at Microsoft Word to answering emails, things like that. It just opens up a lot of possibilities and it works really well. Aside from that, you can see there is a front-facing 5 megapixel camera on the very bottom for video chatting and Skype. There's also a fingerprint scanner. Unlike the majority of all uh, current Chinese smartphones, this fingerprint scanner also dubs as a physical button. So it's not only something that you can just tap on to unlock, which by the way, it's very fast and 
very accurate in our testing. It can physically depress, just like uh, on an older, let's say, iPhone, for instance. So you can tap and uh, tap all the way down to go back to the uh, main home screen, or I can tap once lightly without pressing down to go back into the previous page. This actually works quite well and enables you to use more commands with this key than on a traditional fingerprint scanner that that, that doesn't actually physical physically press down. The side here just features the volume rocker. Now I found the placement to be pretty comfortable, but it took a bit of time to get used to because it's located on the left hand edge of the phone, whereas on a lot of smartphones that I've used recently, it was more commonly found on the right hand side. So a slight adjustment required, but the keys themselves are tactile, they're responsive, they're etched in metal, and they feel premium. The back here also features a dual camera setup that uses a primary 13 megapixel sensor uh, in addition to a three megapixel secondary depth sensor to create uh, bokeh effects uh, similar to a DSLR. There are some quirks in terms of the software and how it processes the images, and we'll take a closer look at that when we get to the camera portion of this review, but still it's a nice hardware feature along with a single LED flash. The device does not have a removable kind of a battery, but the battery pack rated at 4,025 milliamp hours lasted me over uh, two days on a single charge with light usage in between, so very good battery performance, and it charges up in under 2.5 hours, which which is also fairly decent. Again, this is the SIM card slot, which can also take two SIM cards, or alternatively, you can also put in a micro SD card to expand on the internal memory. All right, so turning the device on, we are immediately greeted to this beautiful display. It's a laminated screen, which has good, uh, generous colors that that are vibrant, popping, deep blacks, and also fairly wide viewing angles thanks to the use of IPS technology. However, it's technically using a resolution uh, that, that is known as um, HD+. It's not full HD, so it's slightly higher than 720p, um, but one of the reasons why the resolution isn't you know, full HD or quad HD is actually due to this aspect ratio, because there are still relatively few phones on the market that have the specific two by one aspect ratio. Um, the current uh, you know, kind of Norm is still around 720p for uh, manufacturers, especially ones that are trying to come out with uh, less expensive products, such as HomeTop. So that's the current resolution. It doesn't actually detract from the viewing experience, in my opinion, because I tried comparing it with a device that has a full 1080p panel, like the Bluebo S1, um, and I found very few differences between the two. So you ha basically have to put these right next to your eyes, and even there, it's really hard to tell the differences. There's no pixelation in terms of text uh, when you're browsing the web, so it's quite difficult to tell unless you're using it for VR and putting it into a helmet. Um, so display I'm quite pleased with. With that being said, there are still a few kind of downsides to uh, you know this particular aspect ratio and perhaps one of those you know, it's content that's available at the moment. Because if you go into places like YouTube, just like on the iPhone X, you'll find a small kind of black border on the top because most of the videos that are available to stream online aren't encoded in such a widescreen view. There are some select movies and films that you find also streaming on Netflix. Also, of course, you can capture content using this aspect ratio with the camera. But again, it's relatively few and hopefully it's going to increase as more and more devices adopt this aspect ratio. Ratio. But at the moment, it still is a little bit limited and you do get a few more kind of larger bezels um, that uh, pop up virtually on screen. All right, so the touchscreen itself is also very, very responsive. Um, it's fluid, it had no issues in terms of recognition, and this means that typing out text and characters is a joy. Speaking of, we can quickly launch into, I guess, the browser next to take a quick look at that. Um, so if we type on the address bar, you can see it's using a very stock version of the uh, Android Nougat keyboard. It's responsive and despite having small bezels on the edges, it's still very easy to type. Um, I had no issues as far as very rapidly typing out characters and using multi-touch gestures for symbols. The uh, accelerometer is also quite swift and gives you a very stretched keyboard that is ultra wide and pretty comfortable for typing if you have larger hands. All right, so speaking of the web browsing experience, right now we are loading up kind of the full version of the New York Times, and you can see that this is a good benchmark for a complex page, uh, just because it has many flash elements, it has many interactive ads, scrolling bars, which is a nightmare for uh, typically low power devices to completely render. But on here, it actually seems to be quite uh, you know, well displayed. Obviously, it's not going to be instantaneous. You do have to be slightly more patient with it, wait a few seconds for everything to load, but once it does, 
scrolling as well as pinch to zoom remains lucid and responsive. Text reflows and again makes for a great experience. However, if you use this in a horizontal view, you'll notice that, um, again, it's very widescreen. And um, again, this aspect ratio, in my opinion, does better for watching videos than necessarily doing a ton of web browsing in this horizontal view, at least, just because with the black bars taken up by the settings and by the uh, you know back, forth, address bar, uh, it leaves a very you know, narrow bar of, of screen real estate to look back on content, which requires a bit more scrolling, even if you get a wider uh, you know, glance of everything at once. So that's something to quickly point out. Overall, the web browsing experience is good, but only the standard kind of Android browser based on WebKit is installed by default. Despite the fact that they give you a full suite of Google apps, it seems that Chrome has not pre-installed. It's not a huge deal, and you can always install it yourself by going to the Play Store, but it's something to quickly point out. All right, so now pointing out the uh, kind of elephant in the room, HomeTop, just like many Chinese OEMs, similar to Lenovo, Xiaomi with their MIUI, is using a custom kind of launcher or skin on top of Android 7.0 Nougat. It's a fairly heavy customization, but in my uh, opinion, it's also fairly smooth. Uh, there's not too much kind of extras going on, but it's a pretty dramatic visual uh, overhaul compared to the original. One of the most notable differences is you won't find a consolidated app sure at the bottom of the screen. So there's no way to tap there and then look through an entire menu of your apps. Instead, they're all scattered on different pages on the home screen, kind of like iOS, essentially giving you unlimited pages to populate with your favorite apps. All right, so going back now, we can talk about the camera performance. So again, with the dual camera setup, it is one of the trends of 2017. And what's interesting here is that the interface is something very, very you know, almost stock at Android. There have been a few modifications in terms of menus and settings, but it's not at all like what we saw on the uh, Bluebow S1 and on some recent ZTE phones, which employed a design similar to iOS that had a circular icon for recording video. Overall, it works fairly well, although focusing with this particular uh, setup does take a few seconds longer than maybe what you're used to. Uh, but afterwards, you can tap to focus and instantly capture a shot. By default, you're in the regular photo taking mode that just uses the primary sensor. I can swipe up to take a look at uh, some additional instant filters that I can apply onto the interface if I'm interested. And from the top, I can also toggle between HDR, the flash settings, reversing to the front facing camera, uh, etc. Tapping on settings here gives me some more advanced menus such as exposure as well as uh, other uh, things to change. Um, there is an optical image stabilization, but there is electronic image stabilization as you can see here. All right, so taking a look at some of the images that we've took here, uh, there's also the ability to edit images immediately, which is nice. Um, you can see that this is one of the kind of a bokeh effect blur modes. I'm taking a shot at this bottle, and I think that this is actually improved compared to the Bluebow S1 and on some previous phones that I've seen. The edges on here aren't too bad, and for a shape that gets closer to a square than something just a small circle, it actually seems to be recognizing it without too many problems. So uh, not, you know, certainly something that's uh, gotten better. The, f the background here again is completely burnt out. And here is an image of another object that you can see is do doing a respectable job of creating some depth uh, in the shot. Now in terms of low light situations, the camera of course doesn't perform quite as well. There's uh, quite a bit of noise. However, colors are still uh, reasonable when there is the slightest amount of lighting and you can still uh, make out some details like letters in the background. So overall it does work for the uh, occasional snap in the dark, but uh, I wouldn't say this is a outstanding nighttime camera, but uh, in good lighting conditions you can definitely play around with it and get good enough shots to post and share with social media. One of the extras of this particular interface is this uh, assisted kind of touch icon, uh, which allows you to move it around on various pages on the screen, and then of course also tap on back, uh, menu, and multitasking without having to reach all the way to the bottom of the device if you find it difficult to be doing kind of hand gymnastics with such a long phone. You can see that with four gigabytes of RAM, the device handles multitasking really well. It's been quite smooth. These tr traditional icons can also be hidden if you don't want to use it, and you only are using the assisted touch feature. Other things you can find in the settings include a few gestures for waking the screen on. So these are pretty typical. You can double click to unlock it, three fingers down to capture a screenshot, and that works pretty well 
Over here, there's also motion sensing, so you can flip the phone over to reject uh, or silence a call. And in terms of smart wake up, you can also use it when the phone's display is off to draw symbols like C, O, or M to map to various controls, such as instantly launching the camera. It works, and again, it's a pretty common feature now on a lot of these phones, but uh, it is still a nice feature that you can get to customize it with nonetheless. When it comes to call quality, which at the end of the day is still the most important attribute of any phone, I found the HomeTop S9 to actually be quite good. I tested it out with AT&T and T-Mobile services here in the Bay Area, and I was fairly pleased with the reception quality. I was consistently getting roughly three bars of reception, and uh, callers said that my voice sounded fairly clean and natural without too much distortion or noise. So that's been our review of the HomeTop S9 Plus for 160 bucks unlocked with a 6-inch display that has a ultra modern 18 by 9 aspect ratio, nearly tri bezel-less technology with the top as well as the left and right corners, an outstanding build quality and feel in the hand, great battery life as well as great OTG and headphone support for adapters. In addition, it has great smooth silky performance that rarely hiccups in day-to-day -day usage even when playing back uh, you know, fairly modern games and browsing websites like the New York Times, this is again a near, nearly flawless uh, device at this price. Obviously it's not going to be quite as fast as the latest flagship that costs you know, many times the price of this thing, you know, putting this up to something like the iPhone 10, which costs a grand, it just seems like this is a much better option just because you can do everything that it uh, offers at a fraction of the cost and you're not getting a significantly downgraded experience at all. From call quality to playing back games and apps to watching movies, everything is snappy, everything is responsive.